Greetings, citizens. Hey, you, hey, you beautiful, creepy little human being, you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow, in all of this craziness, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of Kirsten Costas. Kirsten Costas was murdered when she was 15 years old, standing outside of her neighbor's home. And the culprit? Another 15 year old girl. This murder went on to inspire a movie that you may have may, may or may not have seen called Death of a Cheerleader. It's also called A Friend to Die For, depending on what country you're watching it in. And it's just really just such a sad case. And we're going to talk about it today. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new Morbid Makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. I want you to come and join our crew and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. So now that we're done with that pesky but totally necessary self-promotion, we can get into this case. Now this case is one that was suggested to me by two subscribers, David and Jen. Hi, David. Hi, Jen. And when I started looking into it, I was like, man, this is a really, really sad case. And I became really engrossed in it because I'm pretty sure, I'm like 99.99% .99 sure I saw the movie Death of a Cheerleader when I was younger because it was one of those Lifetime movies. And man, when I tell you I watched all the Lifetime movies as a kid, this, this was no exception. And in preparation to doing this case, I watched it again. It's for free on YouTube. And they did a pretty good job, actually. I mean, the acting, not it. But as far as like following the case and staying pretty true to the, the narrative, it actually was. So if you want to watch that, it's for free on YouTube. Just death of a cheerleader, it'll come up. Um, but before you do that, let me tell you the story of the actual case first. Okay, so come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of 15 year old Kirsten Costas, the real life death of a cheerleader. So let's jump in our handy dandy time machine and head to 1984 in Orinda, California, which was located in the Santa Maria County, just about 30 minutes away from the big city of San Francisco. In 1984, the group of people who lived in this area were people who were, you know, well or off individuals, people who made a pretty good amount of money and they moved here because one, it was expensive. It seemed to have the best schools and a relatively low crime rate, just like the perfect place to raise some good well-behaved, out-of-trouble children, if you could afford it. And this is where Kirsten Costas, the subject of today's video, was living at the time of her tragic murder. Kirsten Costas, born July 23rd, 1968, making her a Leo, was the eldest of two children. Her and her brother Pete were raised by their parents, Arthur Costas, who just went by simply Art, and Beret Costas. Art worked as an executive of a corporation and made enough money that Beret could be a stay-at-home mom. They were well enough off that not only could his wife stay home, not needing to work, but he could also afford all the extras his family could ever ask for. Swim clubs, tennis clubs, fancy cars, cheerleading camps, skiing trips, the whole shebang. They were, they're doing well. They're doing well in their lives. In 1984, Kirsten was 15 years old and her mother described her as the energy of the house. While the rest of the, the members of the family were a little more quiet, a little more reserved, Kirsten, in typical Leo fashion was just a big ball of energy, always just lighting up a room and making her presence known. Kirsten was always talking to friends and listening to music and dancing around. And she was just described as being filled with vibrancy and life. Kirsten was a pretty girl. She was a cute girl. She was thin with olive skin and curly brown hair. She was a varsity cheerleader. She was on the swimming team and the soccer team. And she worked in her school office and had been invited to become a member of the Bobolinks, which was a sort of like volunteer club that had kind of a sorority feel. You know, I don't know. My school didn't have anything like that, but that's the way it was described. In addition to being popular with her peers and her friends, she was also very popular with the boys. But as much as they chased her, she never really dated anyone. Kirsten was just really well-liked, popular, and she was rich. She was from a well-off family, her father being an executive, as I said, so she was always dressed in the best clothes, and she got to go away to cheerleading camp and cool ski vacations. It was the classic, girls wanted to be just like her and boys wanted to be with her scenario. Of the girls who seemed to want to be just like Kirsten was another 15-year-old girl named Bernadette Prati. Bernadette was a fellow 15-year-old girl who attended Miramonte High School alongside Kirsten. Bernadette, like Kirsten, was a member of the swim team. 
She worked in the school office, and she was also a member of the Bobolinks. Though the two were in several similar groups and clubs and had mutual friends, the two were not really friends, and Bernadette viewed this as Kirsten not really liking her. And she really wanted Kirsten to like her and wanted to be her friend. And based on some of the things that we will later hear from Bernadette, I don't think that's because she particularly liked Kirsten, but because she liked the idea of her and craved acceptance. And that's what Kirsten embodied. She was just overall accepted by everyone and Bernadette didn't feel like she was. Bernadette was embarrassed of her more modest living. She lived with her sisters and her mother and her father, and her father was a retired public utility supervisor. And though her family had, you know, less fancy things, a less fancy house, and didn't like ball out quite as much as others who lived in the area, she saw it as them being kind of, you know, poor. But this was like, this was only in comparison to other people who lived in the area because everyone who lived in that area was definitely more well off than the average bear. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would look hella poor there. I would, I would look very poor there. Bernadette's family was financially fine. They had enough to get by. They just didn't have all the excess that, you know, other people in the area had. But Bernadette was really unhappy because she was surrounded by all of these really rich elite girls like Kirsten. And it made her, you know, question her self-worth, and her self-esteem was already super low. In the spring of 1984, Bernadette had tried out for the cheerleading squad alongside Kirsten, and she tried out, like, she tried really hard to get into the squad, because apparently at this school and this time, cheerleading was a BFD, okay? Big deal. Apparently, cheerleading was taken very serious, very seriously in the school, and before you could even try out, you had to write an essay telling them why you would be an asset to the squad. And then your parents had to agree to pay for your specialized uniforms and to send you to cheerleading camp. And this cost $500. And this is $500 in 1980s money. It just seems like a lot, right? And then once they tried out, the way that they'd find out that they won, okay, they'd have a whole ass ceremony for this, okay? It's kind of like when you watch old movies and I don't know if they, my school, they didn't do this. Maybe yours did, let me know. But in movies where somebody's being announced as prom queen and they have to like go up on a stage and do a whole thing. Well, these girls would be judged by a group of judges and then they'd have that ceremony and they'd call their names, they'd pull them out of an envelope and call their names and they'd go up on the stage and oh my God, and get flowers for cheerleading. That whole, that just seems very odd to me, but that's how it was. So Bernadette was very, very invested in trying out for the cheer squad. Sadly for Bernadette, she did not make the cheerleading squad, but Kirsten did being described as the perfect cheerleader. And this made Bernadette take a giant hit to her ego and she felt incredibly defeated. And if it wasn't bad enough that she didn't get on the cheerleading squad right after she was also denied a place on the school yearbook. And though these might seem like small potatoes to us, these were things that were incredibly important to Bernadette. Bernadette just never felt like anyone liked her or accepted her. So with every one of her perceived failures, her self-worth went down lower and lower. And with her self-worth going down lower, she felt like people liked her less and less. And acceptance and being liked was incredibly important to Bernadette Prouty. So now that you have a little bit of a backstory on these girls, let's get in our time machine one more time and head to June of 1984. On the night of June 22nd, 1984, a call came into the Costas household that was answered by Kirsten's mother, Beret. The girl on the phone didn't identify herself, but we know now that it was Bernadette. This call came in at about 10 p.m., but Kirsten was not there to take this call because she was away at cheer camp, because as I told you, it was mandatory. If you got into the cheerleading squad, you had to go to cheer camp. So Kirsten wasn't there to take this call. And it turns out that Bernadette knew that Kirsten wouldn't be there to take the call. That's why she called then, because she knew that if she had called and actually spoken to Kirsten, Kirsten likely would not have been receptive to this call. Bernadette informed Beret that the next night on June 23rd, she would be picking up Kirsten to go to a secret Bobolinks initiation dinner. And she wanted this to be a surprise. She wanted to surprise Kirsten with this. So she said just to have her ready, have her all dolled up, and that she'd be picking her up the following night. And with this, the call ended. 
The following night, June 23rd, Beret, Art, and Kirsten's brother Pete were all out of the house at a dinner for Pete. I think it was some sort of sports thing. So Beret called in at the house to say goodnight to Kirsten at about 8.30, saying, you know, I love you, have fun, I'll see you later tonight, and then hung up the phone not knowing that would be the last time she would ever speak to her only daughter. While this was happening, Bernadette Prati was being driven by her father to a house that was not far from her own family home where she had told her parents she was going to be babysitting that night. Bernadette then convinced her father who had driven her over that night to leave the car with her even though she didn't have her driver's license yet. She said that because she was going to be babysitting alone that having a car in the driveway would make her feel safer because if there was any sort of burglar or something, they would see a car in the driveway and assume there were adults home. And after a little bit of persuasive, her father agreed to this and walked the short walk home, leaving Bernadette with the family car. Shortly after that, Bernadette arrived at Kirsten's home. And at first, Kirsten was not like totally thrilled to see Bernadette. She was like, oh, it's you. Yikes. But Bernadette then informed her that like, okay, we're not really going to a bobolinks party. We're going to go to the super cool unsupervised house party. And with a little persuasion, Kirsten got in the car and the two rode off together into the night in Bernadette's family's beat up orangish colored Pinto. What I will now tell you is Bernadette's account of what happened that night. As I said before, the whole reason that Bernadette had made up the story about the Bobolinks having an initiation dinner was a cover for Kirsten's parents so that the two of them could go to that super cool unsupervised house party. And the reason that Bernadette wanted to do this and wanted to like trick Kirsten, get her out of the house to go to this party is because she wanted to finally forge a friendship with Kirsten. On the way to this party, the two ended up pulling over in a church parking lot because Kirsten wanted to smoke a little weed before the party. And it was while parked in this church parking lot that an argument ensued between the two girls that ended in Kirsten telling Bernadette that she was super weird for, you know, lying to get her out of the house, trying to get her to this party and because Bernadette would not smoke with her. Bernadette said that Kirsten made her feel dumb for being a square and not wanting to smoke with her. And then Kirsten got out of the car to try to find her own way home. Bernadette then saw Kirsten walk over to the home of one of Kirsten's family friend's house. This was Mary Jane and Alex Arnold. They were friends of Kirsten's parents. And she knocked on the door and was like, hey, can I make a phone call? I need to call my parents to pick me up. And when the Arnolds looked out, you know, down out, out behind Kirsten, they saw a girl with a roundish face and light brown hair standing behind Kirsten out at the street. When Kirsten was in the house, she first tried to call her parents, but found that they still were not home yet. So she then asked if the Arnolds wouldn't mind giving her a ride home because her friend had gone weird on her. They agreed and Mr. Arnold started to drive Kirsten home. And this is when Bernadette followed behind Mr. Arnold's car in her Pinto. While driving, Mr. Arnold noticed that they were being followed and was like, you know, what's going on? What's up with that? And Kirsten said not to worry. It wasn't a big deal. She didn't seem to be scared or nervous. She just seemed to be a little bit upset. And while Bernadette was following behind Mr. Arnold and Kirsten in the car ahead of her, she casually noticed that inside her car there was a giant knife. So once Bernadette saw that Kirsten was dropped outside her neighbor's house, she was dropped off at her neighbor's house because her parents weren't home yet. She didn't want to be home alone. Kirsten got out of the car, she took the knife with her, she ran up to Kirsten and she just started stabbing her. So while this was happening, Alex Arnold had parked across the street and was watching Kirsten walk up to the house to wait to make sure she got inside because this is what a good person does. But while sitting there, this is when he saw the attack. At first, Mr. Arnold thought that the girls were just in a fist fight. Like he saw Bernadette run up on her and he saw them start scuffling and he thought they were in a fist fight. But then Kirsten went down to the ground. You know, she's, she's being stabbed. And this is when he saw the shine of the blade and realized that she was in fact being stabbed. But everything happened so fast that Bernadette was done and took off on foot to her car. So Mr. Arnold was like, oh shit, I should probably follow this girl. And he started to follow the Pinto in his car for a short period of time before he realized, oh shit, Kirsten might need help. And he headed back to try to aid injured Kirsten. So this was all happening at just before 10 p.m. And while this was happening, while 
Mr. Arnold had been chasing Bernadette, another neighbor. A man named Arthur Hillman had heard Kirsten scream and described it as a blood curdling scream. And he had opened his door to see Kirsten bloody staggering over to him, yelling for help, saying, help me, help me. I've been stabbed. Kirsten then fell into this man's arms and he did everything he could, he could do to try to save her, but it was no use. She was too badly injured and Kirsten's parents arrived home just in time to see her being loaded into the back of an ambulance where she was taken to a hospital and pronounced dead at 11.02 p.m. Kirsten had been stabbed five times in total. Two of the stabs were to her back and of the five, three would have been fatal wounds. There were also defensive wounds on her forearm. When Bernadette got home after committing this murder, she hid the knife. She flushed a baggie of marijuana down the toilet that Kirsten had left in her car. And then she went on a really casual evening walk with her mom and her dog acting like nothing had ever happened. But once she got home, she spent the rest of the night, the rest of the night restless because she says that she didn't realize that she had killed Kirsten. She thought she had just hurt her. So she was waiting for police to show up at her door because clearly Kirsten would have told police who did it. So she waited for police to show up or for a call to come in, but no one showed up and this call never happened. Instead, the next day she received a call from a friend letting her know that Kirsten had been murdered. And that same day she cleaned the knife and replaced it in her kitchen. And shortly thereafter, she disposed of her sweatpants and t-shirt that she had been wearing at the time of the murder. Police worked really hard to try to solve this case, but the only evidence that they had and the only leads that they had was a young girl with light hair and an orangish yellow colored pinto, but there was no physical evidence and nobody knew who the person was that had called and had gone and picked up Kirsten that night. It took police six months to make an arrest, six months. And what was Bernadette doing during these six months of freedom? Bernadette was acting pretty normal. She was really good at blocking what had happened out of her mind. She took some summer classes. She went to her swim club. She hung out with friends and she even attended Kirsten's funeral, which the audacity, but also she, I guess, you know, had to keep up appearances, but my God, people have the nerve. Play sick that day. You're sick. You can't go to the funeral. You're feeling really sick, right? No, she went. And just a side note, if you ever murder me, do not come to my funeral. The audacity, you're not invited, okay? No. Now, during the six months, what were police doing? During the six month investigation, police searched hundreds of Pintos that matched the description of the car that had followed Kirsten to her neighbor's home that night. Of these cars, they also searched Bernadette's family car, but no evidence was ever found. Thousands of leads were followed and hundreds of people were questioned during the investigation, including a bunch of, you know, teenage girls from Kirsten school, but the police had made no significant progress in whittling down the suspect pool. So local police ended up contacting the FBI's behavioral science unit to try to get a profile made up of the type of person who would have been the killer of Kirsten Costas. And at the time, I don't think this was super common, like um, doing profiling, but you know, that's much more common now. But at the time, I believe that was more of a um, progressive move on the police's part. After getting this profile back from Quantico, local police dwindled down their list and they ended up having a main suspect, Bernadette Prati. But to her friends, like this, was crazy. There was no way that she would be capable of doing something like this. And she was the last person you would ever think of. Bernadette had been given several interviews already, and she was also given a polygraph test. And I saw conflicting information on what happened in this polygraph test. One said that she flat out failed. One said that it was inconclusive. And then when it was revisited, it was found that some part she probably lied at and some was still inconclusive. So I couldn't find clarity on what happened in the polygraph test. But anyway, so police got this profile back and they decided that they wanted to in speak with Bernadette again, naturally. And when they interviewed her again, they kind of told her what the profile was and her response to that was, that sounds just like me. Bernadette then asked police what would happen to the guilty party. And she told police then that she believed that the public humiliation of people knowing that the killer had done it would be worse than having to go to prison, which it's just like, you know, a totally normal thing 
for an innocent person to say, right? Somehow, after all that, the police still let her leave, but Bernadette went home and got very in her feelings, and she started to write down how she felt in, in a list form, which, you know what? I bet you this girl was a Virgo. Let me see if this girl was a Virgo. September 20th. Freaking Virgo. Virgos write lists. I have a Virgo moon. I live on lists. Anyway, her list said, and I quote, number one, I have caused a lot of hurt and pain to a lot of people. Number two, I don't want to hurt people anymore. Number three, I want to go to heaven when I die. Number four, I regret what I did. Number six, if I kill myself, I will hurt people even more, quotes my family. I think I could kill myself. I would go to hell if I killed myself. I would rather kill myself than go on living if people knew. Although it's incredible, my parents are saints who would forgive and love me. Though Bernadette had been good at hiding what had happened and how she had been feeling, the pressure was starting to get to her and after a few days she had finally broke. She was feeling guilty, she knew the police were on to her, and she just couldn't take it anymore. I don't know how anybody can keep a secret like that. I really, I really, really don't. On December 10th, 1984, Kirsten had written a letter confessing what she had done and addressed it to her mother. As she left for school, she left the letter on the counter and she asked her mother, please don't read this until 30 minutes have gone by after I've left. And her mother was like, yeah, cool. I, I wonder what was going through her head at the time, but I'm certain it was not this. The letter read as follows. Dear mom and dad, I have been trying to tell you this all day, but I love you so much it's too hard, so I'm taking the easy way out. The FBI man thinks I did it, and he is right. I've been able to live with it for a while, but I can't ignore it. It's too much for me, and I can't be that deceiving. Please still love me. I can't live unless you love me. I've ruined my life and yours, and I don't know what to do, and I'm ashamed and scared. Please don't say how could you or why, because I don't understand this and I don't know why. Bernadette's mother then drove right over to her school and picked her daughter up, saying that she just wanted to be with her. She didn't even want to talk to, talk to her about what happened. She just wanted to sit with her and be in her presence because, I mean, she knew what was coming. She wasn't going to have her daughter anymore. After that, Bernadette, her mother, and her father all drove to the police station where Bernadette gave a full confession. Bernadette told police the story that I told you above. She said that she didn't mean to kill Kirsten. She only wanted to hurt her. She said that she was worried that after what happened, Kirsten, who was very popular, would go and tell all of her friends that Bernadette was weird and in effect completely ruin her reputation. And that was a devastating thought to her because she had worked so hard on being popular and well-liked and that's all she wanted. So when Kirsten rejected her, she just snapped and got super angry. And she said that she continued to get more and more angry as she approached Kirsten. Kirsten was like, get away from me, get away from me. And the continued rejection made her even more angry. She said that she can't explain why it happened, why she made the choice that she made. She said that she wasn't in her right mind. And if she had been, she obviously would not have made the choice that she made. But to be honest, it did seem like Bernadette had a little bit of resentment towards Kirsten. She told police that the two of them had been on like a ski trip and that Kirsten had been sort of rude to her and said something that implied that her family was too poor to afford to buy her nice skis and nice ski clothes for the trip. And of this comment, Bernadette said, and I quote, it seemed like everyone else was thinking that, but she was the only one who would come right out and say it. And, you know, maybe that was true. Maybe Kirsten wasn't very nice to Bernadette. It's possible. I mean, to be honest, 15 year olds are kind of dickheads. Like, sorry, it's just true. You kind of grow out of that as you get older. But even if that is the case, she didn't deserve to die about it. And I feel like I just need to say it because in, in a recent upload of mine, I got a lot of victim blaming and it's like, who raised you? Don't do that. Most of you are pretty cool. Like a lot of you, most of you are pretty cool, but some of you are victim blamers. So just stop it. So I just feel like I need to say that real quick, that even if she wasn't particularly nice to her, she didn't de deserve to be stabbed to death outside in the dark, in the cold by herself. I feel like that should be a no brainer, but apparently it's not. 
Anyways, Bernadette went on to say that she didn't believe that Kirsten ever really liked her and that she really only thought Kirsten was okay. She said the things that really upset her were the things in her life that she could not change, like her looks, her popularity, or her family's financial situation. Of course, police had some questions about this narrative. They were like, okay, 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 sure. Sounds legit, but if you, if you were going to a cool unsupervised house party with a girl that you're trying to convince to be your friend, a real popular girl that you're trying to show that you're cool, why would you go to this party in just sweatpants and a t-shirt? They were like, that doesn't really make sense, but I'm not sure exactly how I feel about this because straight up, if I was going to a house party, I would gladly go in sweatpants and a t-shirt, but this is also 32 year old Brittany talking. 15 year old Brittany would not be caught dead in sweatpants and a t-shirt. She would have been dolled up to the nine. To the nine, is that the phrase? Anyways, and Bernadette was not, but Bernadette was also lying to her family about where she was. They thought that she was going to be babysitting. So maybe if she was to get all dolled up, her parents might suspect that she was lying. I'm not sure about that, but that's what makes me kind of go back and forth on that point because it made some people believe that Bernadette was just straight up lying and that she'd never planned to take Kirsten to a party. And they're like, okay, another question. Why did you have like a big ass knife in your car? Okay. And her explanation for this was that her older sister, who, who was the one who drove the car, because remember Bernadette didn't even have a license. Well, her older sister, Gina, would take the car to work and she would sit in the car on her lunch break. She was a vegetarian and she would cut up her food with this knife. She kept it in the car to cut up her food, fruits, vegetables, things like that. So there was just always this big knife in the car. And apparently at trial, her sister did testify that this was true. Now, even if this was true, which just seems weird to me, I probably wouldn't leave a big ass kitchen knife in my car but you know, that's just me. Um, it doesn't explain why when Bernadette went to pursue Kirsten on foot after getting to the neighbor's house, like why she grabbed the knife from the car. That, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I guess it doesn't necessarily prove premeditation either. So word got out in this small community that an arrest had been made. And because everyone knew of the suspected age range of the perpetrator, they knew it was po possible <laughs> that it was somebody from their school. So everybody made sure to show up at school that day. They didn't want to be absent and be suspected as the potential murderer by their peers. So it didn't take long for people at the school to realize that the person who was absent that day was Bernadette Prati. And it was super weird. Like people were really surprised. Nobody suspected her. She was the last person you would think would do something like this. And she had seemed just as torn up as everybody else about Kirsten's death. So Bernadette was arrested and put on trial. And during the three day trial, she was supported by her mother, her father and her four sisters. And they all sat together and throughout the trial, they mostly just cried. The prosecution stated that Kirsten was suffering from being rejected and, and embarrassed by her peers and that her murdering Kirsten was premeditated because she wanted to protect her reputation and didn't want anyone to label her as odd or strange and ruin all the groundwork that she had done on becoming a more popular person. And they said that the, the murder was completely premeditated and that she acted with a disregard for human life. I think the prosecution probably went down this road of resentment leading to premeditation because of something that Bernadette said in her confession, because they listened to the confession tape in court um, to corroborate this. And she said, and I quote, I lost for cheerleader. I didn't get the club I wanted and I didn't get on the yearbook staff. The things that got me mad was it hurt and the things that I could not change like looks or money or popularity or things. And these were all things that Kirsten did have, which made the prosecution think or try to spin the narrative that Bernadette was just incredibly jealous and resentful that Kirsten had these things when Bernadette did not. Though the prosecution was aiming for a first degree murder charge, the judge refused to convict Bernadette of first degree murder because the judge did not believe that the prosecution had proved premeditation. And I don't know if I agree. I go a little back and forth on this one. I wasn't in that courtroom, so I can't know what all evidence was presented. But when I think about the knife, even if the knife was only in the car because her sister used it to cut veggies in the car at lunch. Okay, sure. But why did she grab it when she got out of the car? First off, why did she follow Kirsten when Kirsten was getting a ride home? They're 
that's a little bit odd. And the whole drive over, she had a chance to think about what she wanted to do and what she chose to do was to grab that knife and to get out of the car and to go over and stab her. So I feel like it's a pretty fine line on whether or not that was premeditated. Cause even if she didn't bring the knife with the plan to murder, she had time to decide what she was going to do on the drive over. It's not like it was a quick snap, you know? Ooh, I actually, no, I didn't snap. I can't snap. It just seems a little like, I don't know. I don't know where I land on that. Apparently the judge and Bernadette's attorney thought that the trial was all relatively pointless at the end of it all because apparently weeks before the trial, Bernadette had agreed to plead guilty to second degree murder and the prosecution had denied it. So the judge and Bernadette's attorney kind of thought the whole trial was just for entertainment value and to kind of further punish Bernadette. But you know, when Bernadette agreed to plead guilty to the second degree murder charge, the DA rejected it and Kirsten's parents supported the decision to go after the first degree murder charge because they were hoping that she would be convicted of first degree murder. But as we know, that did not happen. The trial lasted for three days and instead of there being a jury because Bernadette was tried as a minor, the, the, uh, the trial was heard just by a judge and that was Judge Edward L. Merrill and the courtroom was packed. There were so many people in there that they were lining the walls. They were trying to sit in each other's laps. There was just so many people there. One, because everybody's nosy as hell. Two, because Kirsten was very popular. Bernadette had people who cared about her too. So all of these people were there and the bailiff often had to kick people out to keep the capacity limit in check. At the end of the trial, Bernadette Prati, who was tried as a minor, was found guilty of second degree murder. She was sentenced to the maximum sentence of nine years in custody in the California Youth Authority and was sent to a maximum security facility near Camarillo, California. She would serve no less than one year and no more than nine. And when she was led from the courtroom, she cried. Kirsten's family was of course devastated by this ruling. It just seemed like such an incredibly light sentencing considering the crime. And Kirsten's mother, Beret, was said to have been mad dogging Bernadette through the whole trial, glaring at her and giving her dirty looks, as I'm sure you can imagine. And after the verdict was read, she said, and I quote, my heart is empty. I ache. I am half a person. She will probably be given her freedom in a few years. I ask the people of California, is this justice? Kirsten's father, Art, said of the verdict, and I quote, I'm not in agreement with the punishment. I am not thrilled or pleased. The trial was good from the standpoint of hearing all the facts and evidence. We've lost our daughter. I don't think the punishment will ever match the crime. The overall response from those who knew Kirsten and Bernadette was, as I'm sure you can imagine, that nine years is not enough. It just seems so incredibly low. And it's kind of crazy actually to consider that somebody could kill somebody and get such a low sentence, but she was tried as a minor, which is why it was so low. It just seems, it just seems crazy that the sentence would be so low when what she did was so horrible. And to answer Kirsten's mother as a citizen of California, no, this doesn't feel like justice. Bernadette tried to parole a few times, but finally on June 10th, 1992, when she was 23 years old and after serving only seven years, she did get paroled and was released from prison. She was then released from supervision altogether at the age of 25 and moved out of state with her family. Kirsten's family actually did end up relocating. They left Orinda, California and moved to Hawaii. And when Bernadette was released, they were clearly against her being released and they just did not feel like the punishment fit the crime obviously seven years for murdering their daughter. I can't imagine how they would be okay, but the parole board went against the family's wishes there. This case was really, really popular at the time that it happened. Clearly, I mean, rich kid gets killed. That's always, uh, especially when it's done by another child, that's always noteworthy, especially in like a wealthy area, you know, but uh, it was so popular that, as I said, a, a movie was made called The Death of a Cheerleader. It's also called a friend to die for. Uh, it depends on where you watch it. I know that's confusing. One is a U.S. title and one's a U.K. title. I think Death of a Cheerleader is the U.S. title, but it follows, you know, the story of the case. It stars Tori Spelling. It's a pretty good, it's not good. It's very Lifetime. The acting's very Lifetime. And don't get me wrong, I love Lifetime movies, but uh, it does follow the case story pretty well, just changing some names and some little things, adding a little bit more of a religious aspect that I didn't find when doing my research, but overall it wasn't a bad watch. So if you wanted to watch it to see a dramatization of this, because some people do really enjoy that, you can find the whole, uh, the whole movie on YouTube. But with that said, that my friends is the story of the murder of Kirsten Costas, the real life death of a cheerleader. What do you think?
I just think it's so sad, dude. I cannot imagine what it's like to lose a child. That seems impossibly sad and it's just like a horrifying fear, honestly, of mine. Like, I can't imagine having kids and something like that happening. It seems, I don't know how anybody goes on and it just seems so stupid and sad and avoidable and like, I get it. When you're 15, most people at 15 just want nothing more than to be liked and accepted and to just fit in. But it's just such a drastic response to the idea that people might find you odd and not like you. Like, in order to not have that happen, you kill a person. And then even after she did it, and even after she was arrested, asking police, like, what's going to happen and thinking that the shame of people knowing and your reputation being ruined would be worse than prison. Like that just goes to show just how important being liked was to her and just how like important her image was to her. And that's absolutely wild to me. I did read that in that area in general, in Orinda and in Santa Mira County, that's kind of just how it was in general, not to the extreme that Bernadette took it, but it was all about appearances and what you had and what you drove and what kind of car you had. So it wasn't an isolated thing to Bernadette, but still it just seems so weird and so far removed from what I would do in response to the same situation. But also you can't hurt my reputation, baby. Everybody already knows that I'm fucking trash. And back to a serious note, which it's all very serious. I just have to like make light of some things or how could I ever do this long term, you know, but they were both 15 years old, 15 babies literal children. And now Kirsten's gone forever. And Bernadette's just now out there living her life. Um, I looked into it. She's changed her name. Uh, literally, it takes no effort, barely an inconvenience to go online and find out um, her new name and see what she looks like. Now I'll, put, I'll probably put a photo for you. But um, she's just she seems like she's doing well. She runs a blog. Now it's just absolutely crazy. <sighs> I really wonder if she did plan it. I feel like if I'm honest, I sort of lean towards no. I feel more like it was probably a response to the fear of being rejected. I don't know if she went out that night with the intention of murdering her. I just, for some reason, I have trouble believing that. It seems like a pretty drastic plan, but then again, I don't know her. Maybe that's the type of person she was, but I did try to look into it and see if there ever even was an actual party that night because I thought that that, there's cat hair on my face. I thought that could shed some light on my, you know, on what was happening and my opinion could be swayed with that, but I couldn't find anything that said if there actually was a party, which leads me to believe that there was a party because I believe if there wasn't a party, it would have been heavily publicized that she lied about there even being a party to get her out of the house. I feel like that would be noteworthy. So my suspicion based on the evidence and what I've read is that there was a party. So <sighs> it's just crazy and sad, man. I don't know what to tell you, but Anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope that it was interesting and informative and gave you all of the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I hope you enjoyed it because I want to put out into the world what I would want to see. And this is something I'd want to see. So I wanted to bring it to you. And of course, thank you for hanging out with me and learning a little bit more about Kirsten today and remembering her with me today because she's obviously very worth remembering. She was such a young girl with so much life ahead of her. And it's so sad to consider somebody that young, just being taken from this earth and having no opportunity to even see like what life's all about. You know, it's just, please let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below, because clearly this case is evidence that if you leave a suggestion, I add it to my list. I put your name next to it to give you a shout out because I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. Of course, make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, specifically you. And if you want to follow me on my other social media, I'm most active on Instagram and Twitter, particularly Instagram stories. They're both Brad or Steen, like my namesake here. And I did make a Facebook page and a Facebook group per a request from y'all. I don't say y'all. I don't know why I said that, but uh, I'll put them on the screen here and I'll put everything in the description box if I can remember. So if you want to hang out, we can. I really like talking to you guys online. It's fun. That's why, you know, it's fun. We're friends. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That's tight. You're tight. Please stay safe and be nice. Just, just be nice. It's, it's not that hard. Be better than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.